Hey guys, um, are you guys up the back? Is this loud enough? A um, bit of group participation initially here. If you guys could find, just dig a bit under the grass and find yourself a bit of dirt. I need you to, everyone here to grab a bit of dirt and get it between your fingers. Get it up your nails. You need, you need just a, enough to be able to have a good whiff of it. <laughs> now, there's probably two possibilities here. You can either smell the dirt or you're smelling bait. <laughs> no, that's the other end of the camp. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that I got rid of the bait smell finally. I was going to sleep the other night and all I could smell was fish. I hate that. Have a good whiff. Just hold on to it, Jake. Pick it up again. Hold on to it. Sam, stop eating it. Yeah. <laughs> you stop smoking it. <laughs> Try it somewhere else. Right at the beginning, if you've ever read the first couple of pages of the book, right at the beginning, God took some dirt and he, he formed man <coughs> from dirt. And he breathed a breath into the nostrils of our forefather, Adam. Out of this. And we're going to return to this. And some of you here might think that's all we are. But I'm here to tell you, the book is true. Yep. That he breathed <laughs> life. And every one of us contains, all we are is dirt. But there's something very precious inside of us and that's that breath of life that God put inside us. And uh, a few of the boys were talking about grand design, that, that show that probably all of us here like, or some of us more than others. We are all a grand design by the designer, by the creator. And, and the worth that is in us is because of that breath. And then later was proven because of a, our older brother. And I'll get to that in a minute. I want to pause. As I pray, take a deep breath and contemplate that. Father, you are here with us now. I love this outdoor tabernacle. I love as we sang that song, God of Wonders. Lord, the, the, you are majestic. And what we see around us is a reminder of how majestic you are, how awesome you are. And our very breath today is a reminder of where we're from. Thank you, we are so much more than dirt. Because you've placed value on our lives and you've designed us for a purpose. Thanks for the kookaburras, God. Thanks for your angels that surround us now. Father, I just pray right now that any of us here that as we breathe that breath, we, we don't truly know you. For any of us here that may have more doubts than faith that that breath came from you. I pray today you would just do the miraculous and that you would just reveal how true it is and that for each one of us we would be able to make our own decision at some point in our lives to believe and to have faith in that, that reality. I'll just commit that to you now. Amen. Something else happened in the very beginning. It was early on in the piece. And I'm spewing about this because up until this point, God had made Adam and he'd made Eve. And it was, a, it was a sort of like a camping trip, really. It was God had set up this awesome garden for them to hang out in. And for all the married men here, this was awesome because it was, there was no, no clothing. It was all fine 
nude. For every married man, this is sort of like paradise right there. You're camping, you're nude with your wife. Newly married men. This is on video, this is going on to YouTube. For Bill. Yeah, for Bill there. Yeah. And um, God gave them three things to do. Be fruitful and multiply. So it just gets better, doesn't it? He said, um, rule the earth, subdue the earth, take care of this place. I'll put you in a dominion to look after. Planted you an awesome garden. Take care of it. And then the final thing he said was, um, have a relationship with me and one another. Obviously, if you're going to be being fruitful, you're going to be having a relationship with your wife but also with God, and it talks about later how God would come and walk in the garden by the cool of the day. The Father would come and talk to them. So it's a pretty good setup right there. And then um, in comes the serpent, as most of you probably know. And I just want to zero in on one thing the serpent said. He said about the tree. Everyone's familiar with the story. There's one line in here that he says, if you taste of this tree, you will be like God. Right there is the very essence of sin, very essence of Satan. Satan fell from heaven. It was, he was an angel in, glory, in God's glory and he fell because he thought, I, I could be like God. I could be on par with God. And there, there he infects that into human race. And by agreeing with Satan right there and then, the very meaning of sin is that I can rule my own destiny. One easy way to think of sin, S-I-N, I right in the middle, I. I is what sin is to God. I'm going to turn my back on God because I am enough. I can rule my own destiny. And the other word that sums this up, they go together, is pride. I in the middle of pride, I in the middle of sin. I am man. I can rule my own fate. I can rule my own destiny. And that's what we do to God when we sin. But God had a plan, a rescue plan. He had... You know, the, the thing I can't believe is that God made us knowing that this was what it would take. The rescue plan that would, is what it would take. So I want to rewind the clock 2,000 and so years. And I'm just going to bring us all to a, a story that we're probably fairly familiar with. But Jesus came and... He didn't have that attitude. He wasn't infected with that like all of us are. Guys, if you feel like you've done that to God, welcome to the club. We've all done that to God. Part of being a Christian is realizing that's what we're doing a lot of the time and, and deciding we want to change from that. But Jesus didn't do that. And uh, when he first when he first turned up publicly, this is what he read. He said, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. He came to set us free. He was a freedom fighter. And right before he did any of the awesome stuff he did, and guys, it's not really time. You'll all fall asleep probably if I talk for too long because I think we all had a bit of a rough night. But uh, it's not time to talk of all the amazing things God did. But I tell you what, there's, there's plenty of incredible people around that you can talk to to find out about all the amazing things Jesus did. And not only did back then, but did in our day, has done, does today. But before he did any of that, God 
said this about him. This is my son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Before he'd done anything. We can have an attitude that I, that I am going to prove my worth as a man, that I am going to be someone, that I am going to accomplish this or accomplish that. Before Jesus did any of it, God stamped his approval on Jesus, right? And Jesus lived in a place of that approval. He didn't, he wasn't out to prove himself. And in numerous times he said, I only do what my father's told me to do. He was surrendered. He wasn't about trying to make himself great. It was the father and just following in obedience. So, so we, we get to a place where, uh, of course, the world didn't like this. They didn't accept him. And I'm, I know I'm, this is revision for a lot of us, but I was recently sitting on the dunny, reading my Bible. It's a good, good place. And I read this verse. Now it was the governor's custom at the feast to release a prisoner chosen by the crowd. At that time, they had a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. <coughs> So when the crowd had gathered, Pilate asked them, which one do you want me to release to you, Barabbas or Jesus who is called Christ? In the translation I was reading, Barabbas was called a terrorist. It was only a few days later that I was watching footage of the guys in the UK chopping up a man on the street, blood in their hands, speaking at the camera. Why would they have chosen a terrorist? over Jesus. When I saw that, I just was, you know, it was disgusting. It was just horrific, wasn't it? And yet they chose a terrorist. It didn't make sense to me, and so I kept digging. I started reading the other translations, and what I discovered was that Barabbas was, um, he was thrown into jail for an insurrection. So, so the Jews at this time were occupied by Roman rule. And they didn't like this. They were oppressed as a people. And so some of them thought they'd take matters into their own hands. And there was a group called the Zealots and they were fighting. They were fighting the oppression. And Barabbas was thrown into jail for a riot that had been caused and a murder that had, he had inflicted. But it was an insurrection. It was a uprising. It was a, he was a freedom fighter. He was trying to deal with the problem. And um, I mean, atrocities may have been caused to his family. Who knows why, the, why he had brought to this. But he was trying to do what he thought was kind of God's will, restore Israel. And Israel were looking for a, for a, a, a freedom fighter that would go before them. And they were looking for a Messiah, a savior, one that would set them free. And they thought that he would be a king that would rule with, with an, a scepter, didn't they? They thought he would be one that would overthrow the powers with, with his strength. And here's Barabbas who's trying to do that. You know what? I reckon he was Robin Hood of the day. He was, the, the translation says he was notorious, but what it actually meant was that he was notable. He was well known. So maybe when they looked at Jesus, and especially the, the religious leaders of the day, Jesus was starting a revolution as well. There was two freedom fighters here and they had the choice. One was the self-made man doing it, doing it the way that we understand, fighting fire with fire. The other was walking not in his own strength, but walking according to the will of God and according to the way of the Father. And though he could have called down a legion of angels, as the scriptures said, there needed to be a sacrificial lamb to pay for that sin. There needed to be a, an atonement, which, which really means that there had to be blood shed for the rebellion. And Jesus was a freedom fighter, but it was through his blood, not through the blood of another. 
There's a scripture in Proverbs that says there's a way that seems right, but in the end it leads to death. And Barabbas was doing what he thought was right, fighting the way he knew, and it led to death. I don't know if he was popular with everyone, but certainly he was the one set free on that day. And I wonder what would have it felt like to be him in these shoes. Because right after that, you know, the, the crowd continued to call out, crucify, crucify, and incited by the religious leaders. See, Jesus stood against this idea of religion. Religion says, you must do enough good works and work your way into heaven. It says that you have, you have to um, be good enough. And Jesus said, that's not good enough. Jesus offered relationship. So Jesus offered except that the only way was back to relationship. The only way was back to the garden. The only way was to get rid of this thing called sin and have relationship and be an accepted son just as he was. I think what I wanted to get at here, guys, is that we can live with I at the very center, even today in our decisions, even as men of God. We can try and solve our own problems our own way. We can try and, you know, be self-made men. Pride wouldn't be a problem for any of us here, would it? Guys, I've had to, I've had to wrestle with it this week, knowing that I'm sharing today. I want to impress you guys. I want it to be about me. <laughs> Thanks, Jesse, you just helped me. But God, asked, God put this on my heart. He's asked me to stand up here today and to share this. And um, the posture of Jesus and the posture he invites us to is this. I don't know that it's any more vulnerable than hanging on a cross naked with your arms outstretched, accepting the will of the Father, paying the cost. Because right, right after this incident, that's what happened. And um, next time you pull out your tent peg, a nice big thick rusty one, they were nailed through his arms and through his feet. And it's not, it's gruesome. But the thing I wanted to say today is that it's, he invites us to this posture, to a posture that we don't have to find our self-worth in ourself. It's a posture of surrender. It's, a, it's, it's being willing to be a man that's made by God a God-made man, experiencing that very breath that he breathed in us from the beginning, not trying to make it ourselves, not trying to be self-made, not trying to be find our worth in our own abilities. And um, Jesus said, whoever would come after me must take up his cross and follow me. It's an amazing thing. When you lay down your life and when you die, to your own way, he gives you life. It's a different life. I don't know about you, but I've, I've actually had enough of trying to be somebody. Do you ever get tired of trying to, to prove yourself all the time, of trying to be someone, of trying to feel like you're a success in this world, of, of trying to earn the respect of all the other guys, earn the respect of your wife all the time? It's, it's so hard when you're doing it by yourself, when you're trying to be a self-made man. I'm telling you guys, we do it all the time. Since God put this on my heart, I'm just noticing how much I do this. I don't listen to the approval and the acceptance and walk in the way of the Father. I, I try and make it on my own. So, um, today, today I actually just wanted to make the opportunity known there's a 
there's a guy in the Bible, an Old Testament guy who once questioned God about a lot of things and there was a lot of unanswered questions. His name was Job. And he wrestled with a whole lot of things that just seems like reasonable wrestles with God. Why God? Why did you do this to me? Why did you cause all this pain in my life? You, my family's died. I'm, I'm sick. I've had... He, out of anyone here, he had more legitimate reasons to question God. And, and yet he didn't lose his faith. But the thing I, I just am blown away with is that when God turned up, and if you want to read it with me later, come and see me. When God turned up and answered him, he said this, brace yourself like a man. Who of you, who darkens my, with your counsel, who darkens me with your lack of understanding? And then he says, take a look around. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Where were you when I marked out the sky? Where were you when I gave the ocean its borders? If you've got doubts, if you've got questions, join the club. I challenge you to take a walk before the end of this camp and take a look around. Let God be God. Don't try to be God. Let Him be God. And there's another scripture in the same proverb, book of Proverbs that says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. It's not the absence of doubt. It's choosing to trust Him anyway, even though there is doubts, even though there is questions. Trust the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. Don't try and be a self-made man. In all your ways, acknowledge Him. And this is what I, I love about coming here. When you see that sunset the other day, I love Jesse. He's, he's just so quick to point out, look at the sunset, look at the sky. How awesome is it? Every time I hang out with him, he's telling me, Jono, look at the sky. Oh, I love it. In all your ways, acknowledge him. Just say thanks. Thanks, God. I challenge you if, you, if you start to just say thanks, you will be amazed at how much your heart feels alive. And you know, the promise is he will make your path straight. As you trust him with all your heart, don't lean on your own understanding. Don't try and find your own way, but, but find his way. Acknowledge him. He will, let, he will make a straight path before you. And today, some of us may be walking a non, not a very straight path, a very windy path, a very interesting path in life, and I've been there. And I want to invite you, if you've, never, if you've never really acknowledged God or had a really real chat with Jesus about what he's done and said thanks and asked him to forgive you for your sin, for this, if you feel like that's you, then I'm going to invite you just to stay here after everyone sort of makes their way off. Grab someone. Seize the day. Seize the moment today. Grab someone you know and trust, someone you might have come with, and say, I actually need to have a real chat with you about this and I want to pray and talk. I think for all of us, it's probably worth at some stage going for a walk on our own and just saying, Jesus, make me who you want me to be. And just give up, guys. Give it up. Give up your own pursuit of trying to be someone. Let God make you. He's designed you. He, he took that dirt. It's the, the one who makes something, who invents something, who designs it. He's, they're the one that knows how it's going to be most fulfilled and live out its purpose. And I'm convinced that God has a unique purpose for us all. Okay? So let's, I'll just pray. Father, you are, you are good. Sometimes we have questions. Sometimes it doesn't always make sense. But when we look to the cross, when we see what you did, when we see the value that you've placed upon us, the priceless value, the fact that you care about each one of us uniquely, God, the fact that you've made us men to be men, 
that our very manhood and masculinity comes from you. Lord, we want to be blokes for you. We want you to make us real men, real blokes, ones that know how to fight for fight oppression, know how to fight um, in the way that you would want us to, following your way, a way of humility. God, this world doesn't need any more proud men. It needs men like Jesus. And I just pray that you would shape us and make us more like that. For every one of us here, I pray. Amen. Thanks, guys.